forging cyber, forging cyber security experts. Secure Ninja. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV and I'm here at RSA 2014 in my favorite spot in the whole Moscone Center, which is overlooking the show floor. I am speaking with Trey Ford of Rapid7. He is the global security strategist. How are you, Trey? Doing well, how are you? I'm doing great. This has been a wonderful show so far. Um, but I'm wondering, what, uh, what exactly do you do for um, Rapid7? I just started at Rapid7. Very excited about joining. Uh, I've got a couple of things I'm working on. One, I'm speaking for Rapid7, supporting their sales organization, helping with messaging, marketing, and uh, responding to legislative needs, as okay. well as uh, helping the world understand how important research is. Right. Legislative needs, that's a little bit different from uh, what we normally talk to people about. Sure. Um, what kind of legislative needs are there in the community? Well, something that you guys <laughs> will know and care a whole lot about is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Mm -hmm. And there's several other pieces of legislation that basically affect what researchers should be doing, what they should know about, and the kind of criminal law that they may face, depending on the kind of work or what they've done. Right. Um, what are some of like the boundaries that researchers ha have to know not to cross to not have any problems? You know, I, I hope that we can make it that simple soon. Right now, there's a specific clause in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that talks about uh, exceeding authorized access. Mm -hmm. uh, defining authorized access could mean messing with a misconfigured server all the way through defeating a authentication form. Uh, and right now, the way the courts are interpreting this is not helpful for the research community. Do you see it as a common problem that researchers are, you know, overstepping boundaries and getting in trouble with the law? I don't think it's even necessarily just that they're overstepping boundaries. Um, I just came over from Black Hat, and at Black Hat, we spent a lot of time with researchers that were doing really great research, but they were incredibly afraid of having a discussion about what they'd found. A lot of companies will serve researchers with cease and desists and other forms of legal warnings up to and including suing them. This gets really scary really fast. Absolutely. Um, how have the laws changed in recent years? Uh, they haven't. So uh, once the law is passed, they get tested in court. How, uh, how a court decision will stand, case law as it were, mm -hmm. that's really what's going to define and def uh, change how we interact with this stuff. Uh, case law is really what we're paying attention to and part of the projects we're working on is helping define new language to help write new laws that are going to improve the conversation between companies and researchers and the government itself. Do you have any examples of like a recent case law that came into play in court? Uh, let's see, there's, a, there's been a couple of things recently. Um, there was a case where I believe someone with the Scripps Media Service was just doing some Googling. A simple Google query returned a bunch of sensitive information. I don't recall if it was social security numbers mm -hmm. or credit card numbers. Well, the organization that had inadvertently posted this on the internet um, sued the reporter for uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, violating terms of service. Um, huh. It was a Google query. Google had crawled this. They had misconfigured this, placed it in the wrong place. Very, very scary, but how is that at all illegal? Right, they actually got in trouble Google. for Googling something. Well, it's not necessarily what the court says at this point. Mm -hmm. Initially, once you're now involved in a lawsuit, you, I, you know, a researcher, has to come up with money, legal support, and go to court, defend what they're doing, explain all this stuff. Right. I personally don't have that kind of money. I don't have lawyers sitting around waiting to help me. And if it's you versus a really big company, it's a really scary thing when you start looking at jail time. Right. Do you think security researchers are ever kind of like holding back on the research they would have otherwise been doing because they're afraid of some kind of prosecution? I believe so, and I think that's really scary. I'm thankful for organizations like the EFF. I'm thankful for organizations like Rapid7 that are looking forward, wanting to engage, wanting to help change the way the laws are written, how they're being interpreted. Um, you know, when I think about what's going to make things safer, safer for companies, safer for consumers, we need researchers to be able to have an open conversation, a safe conversation. If there's something dangerous, they need to be able to bring it up. Right. So would you say that innovation itself is actually being like stifled by this fear? Absolutely. So innovation, uh, research, if we ask the question, how is legislation guiding research? One, I think legislation ultimately defines what types of education or intellectual curiosity is being satisfied. Number two, if things are being found, we're being prevented from seeing those disclosures happening. It's unsafe right now for researchers to come forward and say, hey, I found this. Hey, this is concerning. This could be dangerous. So it's absolutely stifling innovation in several ways. 
Well, thanks so much for talking to us about this. We definitely look forward to kind of checking back in with you, maybe at Black Hat this summer, and see how things have changed, if things have changed. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Definitely. And everyone at home, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the interviews we're doing here at RSA 2014. Also, follow us on Twitter. We're tweeting out a bunch of cool stuff that's happening at the show here. We even have an Instagram account these days, so follow us on there. I'm Alicia Webb. Thank you so much for watching. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.